if I'm going to be able to handle this exactly like you'd like, but I'm going to give it a great one, two. The church at Thyatira and her problems. This is a long passage of scripture. I want to read verses 18 through 21 in Revelation 2. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and patience, and works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and eat things sacrificed unto idols. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Now the premise on this, uh, this message I want to continue to be with is given to the blood of Jesus Christ shed there on the cross of Calvary. The message is simply to establish the truth, to warn against false doctrine. And every wind of doctrine that's a threat to the church of our precious Lord Jesus Christ. We find in Revelation 1 verse 4, we begin reading there, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This sets up the foundational truths of this church that's hosted this conference. This is not the central theme of the Word of God necessarily, though it is this is the foundational truth. There's nothing we need besides the understanding of Jesus Christ and the importance of Jesus Christ and his work. We have been listening to some wonderful sermons and many things in these sermons, and we know that these sermons are designed to keep within the theme of this conference, and that's what we'll try to do here. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, meaning beginning and the end. There's a lot to be said about this, but we'll just say simply that Jesus Christ is all in all, Almighty God, the great I am. He's the one that sent Moses out. He's the one that sends us out. He's the great I am. Meaning he has all authority in all the things that he does, meaning he is authority himself. In John 1.1, 1, 1, he says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And there's a little article that was not put there, in our English language should be put there, the God. That means he's the only God and he was in creation himself. The angel rejoiced over the creation when Jesus Christ in his presence. He came walking in the cool of the garden when he put his uh, things there and he created this earth. And he came to Adam and Eve there and he started what we call the human race, mankind. Beloved, we have a lot of things this side of that particular situation in the Garden of Eden when we see the fall and many things that happened there in that beautiful garden. Jesus Christ himself has been said many times, has spoken these words to the seven churches of Asia. And he being the first and last, he brings our point of focus to three words in a passage of scripture in this consideration of the church at Thyatira, son of God. This carries with it a positional situation with Jesus Christ, but it carries a mighty thought that he is God himself. All the fullness of God rests in Jesus Christ. There's where it dwells. And beloved, we can't fall short of that. It's not an idea. It's a, it's a promise. It's a fact that we must keep and understand. There is no room for error in that area. Jesus Christ is the God. Being the Word, everything that we're going to talk about, we want to focus on His Word, the Word of God. We want to see the things that Jesus Christ is saying, not so much supposition of what we may think by our own private interpretations. We want to see what Jesus Christ has to say. As he has, what he has to say is he says, my rules are not just ideas, but my rules are firm and fast, being the head and the true foundation of my church. 
The church of the Lord Jesus Christ has rules, not ideas of men, in other words. The rules of the Word of God. Everything is spelled out with the Word Himself as He dispenses these things to us by degree. In other words, we have to crawl before we can walk. There's nothing impossible. Talking to Brother Brantley about this earlier during the lunch break when we were talking, Jesus Christ has no problem delivering the gospel and the truth in His Word to any age group, anybody, indiv individual. Jesus delivered the fact that Jesus was standing there with John was still in the womb, and John leaped, he understood. He understood this was the Lord Jesus Christ in his presence. Beloved, this is the thing we have to understand. God delivers his word, and effectively always. Amen. It hits us mark. Now, Jesus also says that we need to look at him as one who is the one that said, buy the truth and sell it not. That's his word, isn't it? And so we need to understand how precious the truth is. Get it. Hold on to it. Don't try to shift gears. Once we have the truth, we can't improve on that. And we don't need to try to change because when we do, it won't be the truth anymore. That's what I want to think about in the erroneous situations that has crept into our churches through the years. Follow the prophet, priest, and king, Jesus Christ. That's who he said he is. He's a prophet of the church. He's a priest of the church. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. What more do we need to ask of him when he delivers his identity to us this way? We need to learn about the church and the people that exist in the church. It's reality. The church is reality. He has made a little Lord of the angels, Jesus Christ, that he might buy his church. He came into this world. He took on the form of men. He became sin for us. Do we know what that means when all of our iniquities was laid on him who knew no sin? It means all eternity is what it means. The focus of the mighty, almighty God as he is, is and he was and will continue to be. And Jesus Christ was rejected of men and despised of men. Jesus Christ suffered and he died. He was buried and he arose. He ascended up and he's coming back again. That's simple enough. But man, it's complicated with being, isn't it? The church of Thyatira was organized in an idolatrous surrounding, to say the least. <laughs> this is not uncommon. It's already been said many times. But the church of Thyatira was in a place that was unusual public living, to say the least. Satan was... There, in his full identity, open and unashamed, he has no shame, and all the people of Thyatira had a public life that was disgusting in general at least. This was a place where the church was located once again, but this time, this church took the world in and took the identity of the world around them. This is where the problem came. This is what this church sunk to the lowest point that any church could seek to. They, they, they sunk to the point of a satanic, satanic characteristic. Beloved, that's hard to say about the Lord's blood-bought church. When she takes on the possibility of being one that's identified with satanic operations. Within the house of God, how awful this church is. And it represents churches throughout the ages of the Gentiles where the Lord has placed his church in that period of time. We have churches like that all the way. But it goes back, all the way back, to the times of the Old Testament where Jesus Christ is referring to in our text here when he, when he brings out the name Jezebel, doesn't it? These are the same things saith the Son of God. He that has an ear again, let the Lord hear. Let those hear what the Lord has to say. He who has the eyes like unto the flame of fire. The eyes of the Lord is just like that. He looks into the very depths of the souls of men. The flaming word of God. Jeremiah said, I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm giving up. These people are stiff-necked. They won't listen to me. But he said, what? But for the burning in my heart. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus walking with them, and he brought those things that they were not aware of because they were distraught because they thought all was lost. Jesus had arose, and Jesus was victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and he was walking with those disciples of his. And beloved, they lost sight 
of the Word of God and the promises of Jesus Christ. And Jesus went back and he talked about the Old Testament and the prophecy about himself, about Jesus. He taught them on the road seven, seven miles of a sermon, as we might say. And then Jesus appeared to them in their house. For a little while, he, we will ask Jesus to abide with us and bless us for just a little while. And so he will. These disciples, when Jesus disappeared after he had broken bread, symbolic of him and his word, and we see that he disappeared, they said, Did not our hearts burn within us? As he spoke these words, the sound of Jesus Christ is the moving, living word of God that we have in these Bible conferences in our churches. This church hosts, hosts the living, moving word of God. Jesus said, I will look in the depths of the soul. David knew about this in Psalm 139. He asked the Lord to search his heart. Now, beloved, that's a hard request when we ask Jesus to search our hearts. We already know he looks into the very depths of the soul. And to ask him to search that heart is to find those things and see those things and expose them that we can't even imagine we have in our hearts, which are desperately wicked. God said, who can know them? He knows them. And when he searches the heart, he reveals these things to us. Now he's searching our heart and revealing to us time and time again in these meetings our desperate situation, our defilement, our corruptness, all the things that we think we don't have anymore. Yeah. Beloved, we have them. Yeah. The feet of Jesus Christ, he said, are fine brass. This is the judgment of the Lord. And beloved, this is not only in this place we find in the very first chapter, many places in Revelation. And even in the Old Testament, we find the Lord describing himself and his power of judgment against the untruths of men, against nations, against individuals. I know thy works. I know they're good. And Jesus Christ knows our works. And Jesus not, is not giving the church at Thyatira a compliment. He's stating a fact. I know you have good works. You're my church. I bought you with my own blood. I've established you correctly through the way the scripture said for you to be established. There's no mistake in you being my church. I love you forever and ever. You're my church. I bought you with my own blood. I've cleansed you, and you are my pride and my joy. I've espoused myself to you and you to me. We're going to have that great wedding one day. We're going to have those wonderful things where we'll reign upon this earth. We're going to have those beautiful things that we desire to have in all eternity. But remember, when you look at the throne, my throne, you'll see a lamb as it were slain forever. Remember, that's who you are. I was slain for you. It wasn't a pleasant thing, but it was the thing that had to be done. It was a righteous, eternal thing that I did. So we know that he's placed in the church faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these, he says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, is, in verse 13, the greatest of this is love, charity. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. Have you heard the Lord say that to you lately? Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you, church, individuals. The old Babylonian Empire under Nimrod and Semiramis was a corrupt situation. We know Semiramis. We know about Tammuz. We know about all these things that she brought in this idolatry and all the deaths that came and all the things that came under the power of Nimrod and forcing all of her idolatrous ways. And it had not been for God and his prophet intervening, Israel would have disappeared God would not let this because Jesus was the promised seed in her. And therefore, he stopped Semiramis and Nimrod. He stopped Baal. He stopped all these things in the Old Testament when we find the worship of all these things, the sun God that was here in Thyatira and all these things, all this corruptness. He stopped this in the Old Testament that we might find Thyatira in the New Testament doing the same thing. And he had to visit her also. We find Jezebel, the wife of Ahab. We know the story, the daughter of Ethbel, the Zidonian. We know this. And this reference being made to her false doctrine, being practiced in this church, was a terrible reference. It was an awful and pitiful thing. And to say the least, it was very corrupt. This was a thing that Jesus Christ took no pleasure in, but he certainly does it. He brings those things 
that are festering to surface, doesn't he? So he's made reference here to the practice of this church. And he identifies many churches that he's bought with his blood. Shamefully, we have to admit it. In other words, there's a worm in the apple. Jesus Christ is revealing this worm. Jesus Christ has looked into this church and revealed her to us that we might learn, be admonished with these things. He ate the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, and Adam willfully, in a terrible act, though it was necessary, agreed to transgress the law of God with her. It was needful, but it's still judged. It's still brought up, but it brought us to Genesis 3.15 and the necessity of that. We need a Savior, and this is what we have as a result in Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, we have spiritual adultery. We have terrible sin against the Lord in his churches. And beloved, this is the false doctrine of such corruptness that Jesus is warning us about today that was brought into this church. But his fiery indignation, the Lord Jesus Christ came upon her. And I'll say when it did, beloved, there was much pity for the church as being his church that he loved. But there was no pity on that sin. The fiery indignation of Jesus Christ looks into this sin and it takes it and divides it asunder and takes everything about it. And Jesus Christ judges it bit by bit. And in a whole, Jesus Christ will cause it to be broken into shivers and pieces. Jesus Christ will do that. We have an adulterous action here with the church, the rule of practice and order in our adulterous ways. Now, Jesus Christ was not hesitant in delivering this particular message to her when he found there and saw there and reveals to us that this was a place where all of these, the, the office of the church was subverted. And we find that it would fill with those who were not qualified and especially in one situation. The ways of ungodliness was being led by that which leads the old whore out of the water that day when Jesus Christ later on has revealed her and her judgment. This is the same kind of situation the church at Thyatira had possessed and was in her and all around her, that Greco-Roman way and the way of idolatry was in full sway with the church at Thyatira. The Babylonian doctrine was destroying this church. Beloved, and to know what the Babylonian doctrine is, is to know that this is the empire of the Antichrist, the empire of Satan himself. And beloved, we know this was in the church. Jesus said, that suffers that woman Jezebel, that Jezebel of a woman. Brother Paul, I didn't want to make this date, but I had to make it. And here we are, she's now, I'm with her. We're with her, but it's not good. It's not pleasant. It's pitiful. It's a sad, terrible thing to have to make a date with her again. The prophets of old had to be with her. We see her murderous ways, her hatred, being the son of one who was a prophet of Baal. We find that also she was a prophetess, Jezebel, and she was a hateful, satanic woman, to say the least. And she hated the prophets of God. And beloved, it was no surprise for them to be, have to be hid in the caves to hide from her. And it was no surprise that Elijah, who had the power of God to destroy, rain down heaven from heaven, fire from heaven, and pray to God and destroy 400 and so prophets of Baal. It was no surprise this man had that kind of power God had given him as he sent him out as a prophet. But it's no surprise that Satan is so, listen, don't think for a minute that we're facing a different Satan today. This Satan, Elijah was so afraid of Jezebel who was possessed with this Satan that he ran as far as he could run and hide. He didn't trust God. We talk about trusting God, but I'm going to tell you, beloved, God is warning us as individuals and our families. He's warning this nation. He's warning this church and all the churches represented. He's warning us Satan is real and he's powerful. He's not just the prince in power of the air. Don't just pass through that lightly. He is a powerful, powerful being. Amen. Beloved, we need to understand that when we see these examples that Jesus has brought to Thyatira, 
that Jezebel, that, that Jezebel of a woman is there with you. That that's a scary and an awful and a powerful thing that existed in that church. It wasn't a light matter at all. And he said she calls herself a prophetess. Jezebel called herself. She wasn't called out of God. She was full of Satan. And beloved, this is what he's telling the church at Thyatira. Listen, Jesus Christ is angry because this church has these idolatrous ways in her and has this leader in her. Now we're getting to the meat of it. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Of what's really going on with this church. You're going to have to spare your ears and your hearts just a few minutes with me. Those who saw her wonderful works and hide our face and shame together saw her adulterous works. Yes, it was the way of the Nicolaitans also. Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans, they were dominant, a dominant group of people. They dominate, dominated the people. We know her doctrines in Christ. We know he hated her. But it wasn't just hinted at with our tire. She was practicing these things, actually had these things in full force. The likeness of Balaam and the Old Testament and all these things and conditions had developed. We have churches that ignore the scriptures and actually endorse. I want you to listen to me. Churches that ignore the scripture and actually endorse homosexuality. You say, not our church. This is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. By our tire. Study it. She was not only endorsing it, she was practicing it with some of the members. I want to tell you a little story about Thyatira. The livelihood with the general populace, it seems, this is what they did in society. That was the kind of society they had. The society they had was not only just an adulterous society, it was things that came with men and men and women and women. You hear what we're saying? I want, you, I want you to notice something that developed through the years with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, the men and women donned dresses and head coverings, hoods. They lose their identity as individuals, but they identify themselves in this hidden position they have. They identify themselves as corrupt and secret and in dark mode of mind. That's the purpose of this dress. They, they have a different reason, but the reason they have this is because they, the history has brought this to surface with them, and this church practices these things. We have the monks, and by the way, that's not spelled completely yet. The word's not finished. Monkeys. It should be there. And then they have nuns. That's spelled wrong. It's N-O-N-E, not N-U-N. So we know these are the people that fill this church, and these people are corrupt, and you have all of this homosexuality there. You have all of this adultery there. You have forced adultery, forced homosexual thing. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ at Thyatira was having these problems. And it got to a point they said their excuse was, we have to be like Jezebel. We have to identify ourselves and take the truth of the church and the true worship of God and imprison them and have them put to death by the enemy. We have to be the guide and the instrument. We're inside. We can do this better than anybody else can. Kill their own people, God's servants. Destroy everything Jesus Christ has given them. Make mockery of Jesus Christ is one thing, but the hatred they had for Jesus Christ, the hatred they had for truth and cleanliness in Jesus Christ, Beloved, it was there. We have devil heresies there. If it ain't right, it's wrong, beloved. It ain't right there. And it's wrong, beloved. Jesus Christ said that wicked Jezebel, that killer, that satanic person is there in fire, fire. You have that identity. Now, if you want to argue with Jesus Christ, if you go back and see what he's referring to, Jezebel, you know he's identifying fire, fire with her. And he's identifying her actions with that too. And if you know what she did, and what she practiced as a prophetess, adultery, and every kind of sin that's imaginable things you can't even think of, that's what was there. Jesus Christ said it. Argue with him if you don't believe it. If you don't agree, argue with him. He said that Jezebel, meaning that these things she possessed, was there. And then we're going to take it a little bit farther. 
Not only that, it was spiritual adultery. Meaning everything in the world was going on against the truth of God's word. Now, you say, well, it's not happening in my church. Now, hold on a minute. Give me just a second. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Verse 14 says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. Now notice, able also to admonish one another. Beloved, that's not going on in our churches like it should. Then we find Ezekiel 23, 37, in case we hadn't seen the core of this corruptness and fire tire that has existed since the fall, that they have committed adultery and blood in their hands and with their idols, how they committed adultery and have also caused their sons whom they bear unto me to pass from them through the fire to devour them, offered sacrifices of the children, whatever you may draw from this, beloved. This, these things that we see in Thyatira Tyre is a thing that's been continued since the fall of men and Satan is at his best in this situation that Christ is addressing. Replacing the truth, worship of our Lord Jesus Christ with adulterous ways of men. The Word of God is no longer the only authority in many churches. We have in our existence today of the Lord Jesus Christ. In many cases, churches do not have the Word of God as authority, and the ways of God and the Word of God as their authority anymore. Men became the authority of these churches. We have that progressiveness of the personal views of a person that takes the place of the true Word of God. I want to make that very clear. This is going on in our churches. In other words, the old scripture and its teaching is no longer needed. And I'm going to spread it out. The King James Version is no longer needed. Yeah. And the Word of God, beloved, where it came from and on and on. The progressives of these people and their views is taking it away. A way to divert the scriptures and true teachings is to say the church is wrong and doesn't understand the true meaning and the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's going on. Our churches are being torn apart by the naysayers. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Christ warned us about it. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having each in the ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Beloved, he's talking to the church. Worshiping the creature rather than the creator. The Lord punishes those who fall into adultery, beloved. Oh, can see the judgment of God upon fire tire and upon those churches today. Acts 20 and verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, and sparing, not sparing the flock. Also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Beloved, that's going on in our churches today. That's a sin and disgrace. That's ways of Satan. Beloved, all of a sudden, after all these hundreds of years, and even thousands of years, the church suddenly is wrong. The Word of God suddenly is not good enough. It's not right anymore. So be on your guard. False teachers tend to rationalize away the truth so much that they compromise their convictions and end up doing the wrong things they know that are wrong. They know they're wrong. We may think a teacher or the teaching may sound good when it isn't right at all. We may think everybody else is doing it, so can I. Whether it's physical adultery, whether it's all these things that's being endorsed by churches, or whether it's those things that are lies concerning the Word of God and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we may blame it sounds good for our erroneous ways. We may say, I'm in so much stress with the way things are going in my life, I need a little relief. Quote that little. Put it in quotation. We say that this is a way of interpretation of the, the new way of the interpretation of the scriptures is easier to read and understand. We may say the church had, a, had, a, had it wrong all these years with all the way it uses the office of the Lord Jesus Christ gave to her. The Lord Jesus Christ gave to her. It's wrong. It's not being done right. Really? We no longer need to practice the historical ways. The old ways were not rightly understood and practiced. So we're making it right today. That's the heresy. Beloved, I'll say in closing, get a grip, churches, church members. Of the old landmark Missionary Baptist Church will be obsolete to you and to me. The way we know it, the church we're in, the church doors will be closed. 
what happened to Ephesus that met every day for two years. The church that you're a member of will have the truth change into a lie right before your eyes. Psalm 139 and verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. All of us need to get on our knees and ask God to do that. With all of us, we need that. Amen. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me to the way everlasting.